Welcome everyone. Welcome to the Q&A session for Embodying the Mystery Virtual Retreat. My name is Stephanie Mukes and I'm the program director here at the Strozzi Institute. And it is my pleasure to be here with Richard Strozzi Heckler, who for those of you who don't know him yet, he is the founder of the Strozzi Institute. And he's spent the last over 50 years researching developing and teaching somatics to business leaders, executive managers, teams of Fortune 500 companies, NGOs, tech startups, nonprofits, the US military and the government. Uh, he's also the best-selling author of eight books, now coming on nine books. His latest book, Embodying the Mystery, will be out in hopefully early 2022. Um, <clears throat> he's also a seventh Don Sheehan in the martial art of Aikido, and he's also the co-director of the Mideast Aikido Project that brings together Israelis and Palestinians in connection and practice. So welcome, welcome, Richard. Glad to be here with you today. Thank you, Stephanie. Good to see a number of familiar faces and new faces. Yeah. Um, we have some questions inside that have already been sent in, and I'm going to ask you all if you have questions. We have an hour of Q&A here. Great. Um, yes, and so, so for those of you who are with us live, if you are interested in asking a question live, you are welcome to raise your virtual hand, or you can place it in the chat, and we'll just feather, feather you in with the questions that were uh, sent in ahead of time. Let me just load question number one, if you're ready to dive in with me here, Richard. All right, rock and roll. Um, so this first question comes from Emily, who I actually see is here on the call live. So Emily, are you willing to come off of mute and ask your question, putting you in the hot seat? Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Yes, I'm happy to. And Richard, thank you so much. I am so very interested in this um, intersection of somatics and um, spirituality and the mystery. Um, and my question is um, around, well, let me back up. Right around the time that I started uh, with the coaching certification course, which for others who are here, I'm, I'm in right now, um, uh, a um, spiritual science came my way that I became in uh, equally interested in. And um, what my, my question revolves the, the notion of bringing my awareness into my body versus having my awareness as myself, um, uh, as an infinite being, um, pure soul, pure awareness, not having a body. And um, the, the part of me that is neither born nor dies. And when I, I find when I put my awareness in my body, um, I forget about that other part, that seed of self that um, is very soothing and um, uh, peaceful for me. And so I'm, I'm so interested in the juxtaposition of those two seats, for lack of a better word those two seats of awareness or consciousness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember your question. I think it's a question that many, many people have, uh, both at really a very secular level of the notion of kind of a mind-body split, and also maybe of a body-spirituality split. And the first thing I think that I would like to say is we, we really make this distinction between what we call the, the, the medical body or the Cartesian body, which is made up of all these different parts, you know, and the 
parts communicate with each other and there's a nervous system, then there's a muscular system and so forth, but they're really different parts. And when we speak about the soma, which means um, the shape of your livingness, the, the, shape, the shape of your aliveness is really what we're doing is that we're saying that those qualities about you being pure awareness and having a feeling of joy and peace and tranquility, we say that lives inside of us. Mm. Um, and that the, the, the shape of our livingness is the doorway to touch into that. So people can have the notion of, gee, that idea makes sense to me. It's a concept. That concept makes a lot of sense to me. And um, that's what I'm aiming for. But it's still really in the conceptual realm. Now, when I read your question, I thought one of the profundities of it is you said you knew that this was really who you were. And I listened to that and had this experience not just the concept of it or the good notion of it, but you actually had the experience of it. In other words, you, you lived it, you embodied it. It was, it was alive for you in that moment. And when we're in that moment, we're really free of concepts and ideas. We're in a, in a direct immediate experience with what, what we would call source. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much that when we're coming into our body is we're, we're, we're clinging to it or we're trying to make more of it, is we're listening to it in a way in which the more we can relax in here, the more source or spirit can come through. And then we begin to realize that's who we are at a ground level. That's who we are. So I both understand the, the place in which you go or whatever the other teaching is, I don't know, but I, don't, I wanna move away from my body. But we wanna think of body as the shape of our livingness. So even when you had that experience, that was your living, you were living that at that moment. And what we would say that happens, the doorway is through the soma or the body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as you say that, the when I think back on part of my question, the feeling of peace, the, the feeling of, of um, being enough and all of that, I mean, that is a felt experience. Exactly. It's a living, living, immediate, direct felt experience. Yeah. And just one last thing, as you were talking, another realization came to me that this is not my first rodeo in pursuing spiritual paths. And it's interesting that this one has really captured me more than any other, but it's been in tandem with my somatic work. So, um, yeah. Just realizing that for myself right now is is mm -hmm. profound. Follow your heart. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Great. So another question, a related question, is around um, how to shift states of consciousness that a person wants to live in. It's a big one. It's a deep end of the pool. We, we have a practice that we will deepen into um, during these two weekends that we call changing states of consciousness. And what we do is that we get ourselves present and present to the environment, present to others, present to ourself, a presence. We open to possibilities, which means we're opening our embodied imagination and we, we have a connection to what our aspiration is, or why would I want to be in this course? What am I doing inside of it? And then we do a practice in which we, we, we make distinctions between 
really commonly held states of consciousness. For example, we know that there's places where we're worried and we look at the future and we go, how am I gonna do in COVID? Or will I have enough people in Texas, enough drinking water? Or we might be looking in the past, we're worried about the past. Did I say too much, say too little and so forth. That's a, per that's a state of consciousness. And then we develop in this practice what that actually feels like. What is the fee sense feeling of that? And then we can say, and there's another ring around that, another dimension. And let's say we would call that a, f a feeling sense. So we can switch from the thinking self to the feeling self. And then we go through that distinction of like, what, what does it mean by turning our attention to our feeling self that we actually begin to realize that we're larger than this medical body, that the tissues and the skin aren't just boundaries that hold us in. We're wider than that and we can feel into the room and what's in the room. And then from there we make a distinction, let's just call it the energetic body. You know, people will throughout time will have different names for these kinds of things. But the energetic body is similar to what quantum physicists might call that we can actually reach out through the universe and actually touch others who aren't in the same room with us, maybe even not the same house, but outside. Of and and that that's that's by doing this practice over and over again in a number of different ways, we begin to develop a map or like a GPS for ourselves that goes, oh, I'm really in my head now. When I'm in my head, my, my, my life is narrow. My life has very little depth. Um, it has a low ceiling. And I live in this kind of fear space. So if I take a moment, because I built this map, I can then move into the next bigger space and the next bigger space and then the next bigger space. So that's kind of um, uh, cliff notes about changing states of consciousness, but it'll be a, a fundamental practice that we'll do over and over again in our time together. Great, so the next question is from David over cashier. Do you wanna bring yourself off of mute and ask your question? Yes, 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 hello. Um, I trust you can hear me. Yeah, hi Richard, um, thanks for this opportunity. Um, I, I just wanted to know, you know, oftentimes sort of in, in, in the moment, um, it's hard for me to remember to center and access or my learnings. And so um, how do you suggest that you remember that we remember in, in, in the moment and in, in, at the time when there's maybe a, a, a stress or an opportunity to, um, to you know, use the, the, the tools that, that, that we're learning um, in, instead of kind of blazing through with our sort of, um, uh, you know, historical responses? Mm -hmm. What, what, what feels, what is a ground here, David, is the place in which we develop a practice. And what that practice does is becomes a reminder in our nervous system or, or in our spirit, if you will, about waking up. So that, um, like one of my teachers once called effortless effort, that moment where you might be in your meditation or your centering practice and all of a sudden you're awake. And that wakefulness comes from building a practice in which your, your consciousness becomes more stabilized and we're not really being flung about so much by all the different things. And then we build a very intimate and close relationship with that consciousness, that state of being so that there are moments when it looks like we are under a threat, for example, either a real or a perceived threat. 
and we feel all of that conditioning take over, that we have a much shorter route to coming back to observing that, having space with it, and then being more present with it and not necessarily being captured by it. Simple answer is uh, get a practice, get real familiar about what's going on in your thoughts and feelings and sensations, begin to have an anchor inside that practice that begins to stabilize all that, that builds a different awareness for yourself. All right, thank you. You're welcome. So I'm gonna um, read a question that came in to us via online, and then I'll come to you, Tamara. Um, so the question really is about, I'll summarize, <clears throat> that someone has been in other courses with you and has heard you say that you um, reject a particular kind of language that is associated with neuroscience um, but and wanting to get a little better understanding of where you come from is there. Who asked this question? You know, it is uh, nameless. Anonymous. Okay. Yeah, anonymous, yeah. Um, I love neuroscience. I love neuroscience because what I've been doing since I've been very young has been the somatic work and all of a sudden the technology of neuroscience actually ground what we've been doing, but it grounds this, the practice that, you know, we didn't start it here. Human beings have been doing this for, for millennium and millennium and what technology has now um, uh, shown us is that, yes, that's right. If we start to get into our body and we start to let the right hemisphere come forward in our brain, then we're more in the present moment. Then everything is much more immediate for ourselves. But what I did say, I reject the language of neuroscience. I love neuroscience and the technology. I reject the language in the sense that it is as most of science does, is that it continues to divide things, divide things, divide things, until the spirit is longer present, or the yearning or the longing for the spirit is no longer present. So it both takes away the self, and it takes away the sense of a primal foundational energy that animates us and moves through us. And Part of my love for, for neuroscience is that one of our gods in Western civilization is science, right? Um, entertainers are one of our gods. Science is one of our gods. And so in some way for the common person, it means God says, God says that there is this other dimension that we can move towards. And that's, that's, a, that's a great endorsement. <laughs> and Tamara, am I saying your name correctly? Or are you Tamara? Tamara, thank you. Great, welcome. Hi, Richard. It's been a while. Such a treat to see you in person. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. My question is more on the practical coaching side um, with the somatic um, piece. Um, when I'm in a room with one-on-one -on -one or with a small group of people <clears throat> or a group of people, what I can sense and feel in the room individually in the group is very readable. Now that, <clears throat> now that we're on Zoom, it feels very restrictive that I can definitely read energy, but I don't see the whole body and we don't get to see people interacting in the same way because we're all in our own box. And while it's allowed me to expand my business to anyone who has a Zoom connection, be it nationally or internationally, until we get released back into public, what are your thoughts on how to build that credibility piece? It's, it's not so much once I've engaged with someone to coach them, it's their credibility piece on what I can see about them and how they move or how 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 they're moving um, reveals who they are and where some of their breakdowns may be and that bridge is something i'm finding challenging right now because of the um, zoom environment and tamra what do you mean by credibility thank you um 
I can, I've done this repeatedly um, where I'm with people who I know very little and I put them in a triad or a paired circum, um, um, exercise. And I, the assessments I have about why they're having the breakdowns they are, everyone's jaws on the ground. They're like, you don't even know me. And that is so spot on. So when I do that with one to six people and not only the person I'm speaking to, but the other people get it, it's like, I don't know how she does this, but holy cow. And so it's that instant credibility piece that, um, or not even so much instant, but it's, it really deepens the credibility piece. And I'm able to develop clientele from that when it's more you and me on a box in a Zoom call, there's things I can sense and feel, but it's not, I don't literally have the whole picture of your body and you're not engaging with someone else. So I feel, I feel, my experience at the moment is my ability to read them is limited. And so it takes, it's a longer sales cycle. It's a longer influence piece. And I'm trying to find a way to work inside the zoom format with my somatic awareness. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, there's a, there's a book called on the internet by Hubert Dreyfus. And um, it, uh, he's passed on um, uh, professor of philosophy at UC Berkeley but he pointed out how on Zoom, people starting to do Zoom teaching, even some years pre-COVID, very hard to read mood electrically. Um, what I think is useful is for you or the practitioner to really drop really deeply into your own body, your own soma, which is really boundless. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, the medical body is bounded you can have boundaries, then it's really boundless. And really to allow yourself, to, when you say feel into, you don't see their body, what you're really feeling into is the shape of livingness, how they run their energy and how they are being with their energy. So you've been doing this a long time, I know, Tamara. So really let yourself uh, trust that part of yourself in doing that. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm. So the next question, I want to invite Matt Perry to come off of mute. He has let us know that he submitted the question about neuroscience and he has a follow-up. So Matt, will you take yourself off of mute and ask your follow-up? Thanks, Stephanie. And thanks, Richard, for answering the question. And I, I wasn't intending to um, send in that question anonymously. Um, what I've noticed and I was hoping you could address was there's a biomechanical model of understanding humans that seems to be rising. There's evidently a God gene. There's a part of the brain that is our God resides in. And I find it very distressing. And so that's, so the question I think is about that. It seems like the language of neuroscience seems to be feeding into us as these mechanical creatures that seemed that are encased in flesh. And I wanted to expand the question to embrace coaching because there's so much precision in your, uh, in your model about understanding um, shapes and that we're always practicing something. So working with clients, it's super helpful to be very, very clear about certain things and yet allowing this openness for the mystery of things that we don't necessarily understand at the same time that are coming in in very different ways. So this, to me, the question is also about the need for precision, yet an organic understanding of mysterious principles and how you fit those together in your coaching work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks, Matt. If I, if I understand your question, I would, I would say that we're always living in a, um, this dynamic between the relative, absolute, let's call it the relative and the absolute. We, you said mystery, you said yes, and we do have arms and legs and we're gesturing and we're talking, making utterances. And there's one really does feel like the mystery and one feels like this place in which I have to make the kids sandwiches, I've got to pay my bills, and 
we are involved with that kind of thing. And I think that really we can move towards a more complete model if we really allow ourselves the long view of um, really seeing humans as being inside of that particular dynamic all the time. And at least from my view, I think one of the pieces inside of human being, all human beings, that's a big statement, but all of those I've ever met is there is some kind of a longing for the greater or the source or the mystery or the absolute, whatever is it that, that's, that's calling you at that time. And um, we, we, we then begin a certain kind of marriage between that way of being, that level of awareness and that level of consciousness, that level of vastness in space to here we are right down here on earth. And we're having to do these things daily that will take care of me and I'll take care of my loved ones and I'll contribute to the community. And when you say how to do that, how can we do that? Um, I would hold, that's really the mystery. And who, who is this, who is this Matt? Or who is this Richard? Or who is this Tamara? That want, can hold those two big pictures. And in holding those two big pictures, listen to the energy of it and allow it to inform us about the actions we were, can best take that will be most skillful. Like Lao La Tzu said, the, the place where the mud starts to clear and we see there's the opening to it. And I know you've been doing this <coughs> a long time. You can see in some people, it's just we need to settle first. We need to settle all those mutterings and all those mental cajolings and cognitive thoughts. And then we see then there's a space that's involved in, and I can join that space concerns that are more granular. So another question that came to us online is what kinds of breakthroughs have you seen in people um, doing this work? And maybe most specifically around connecting soma and spirit. That the things that would, I call it the, the, those, those themes of our attention, those thieves that want to steal our attention, certain conditioned thoughts, certain conditioned feelings, certain conditioned emotions, that they become more observable. And one of the major breakthroughs is people then begin to see that, oh, this is drawing my attention in this direction. I'm gonna go down this rabbit hole, go in this hollow here, turn my back on this. And it allows people to then be in a choice at that point. That level of awareness allows people to be in a choice and to be able to then take actions that weren't pre previously available to them. Um, I'm worried about, will I be able to feed my children? I'm worried about COVID. I'm worried about climate crisis. I'm worried, I said too much. All those things I said previously, we go, that's just mental gymnastics that are running. And our conditioning has us go, that's me. By living in the life of the body, we begin to see there's much more space than that. And inside of that space, I'm not so caught up in all these ripples and waves up here, but I'm in deeper and wider waters. Do I have to take care of some things? Absolutely. But there's a whole bunch of it that it grabs me or, or steals my attention that I don't have to go with. Great, thank you. Um, Connie, I see your hand is up. If you wanna bring yourself off of mute and ask your question. Yes, hi. 
Hi, Richard. Good to see you. Hi, Connie. Um, so my question is how you will address all the different skill levels of people who have been on the somatic path for a while and others who are completely new to the field. How, how you will hold this in, in, in your practices. And yeah, that would be helpful. Thank you for that, Connie. To begin with, um, I will ask everybody really to take the long view. So I think it's really necessary to take the long view. We're we're not going to we're not going to solve racism real quickly. We're not going to solve the climate real quickly. We're not going to maybe solve those disputes might have their partner real quickly. So let's relax into the long view. Everybody relax into the long view. So that puts us on a more of an even playing field that um, uh, also the place in which um, we begin to see that there's this disparity between, oh, there's people just beginning the somatic path and other people who have been doing spiritual practice through the soma for a long time, that they're become kind of a morphine. In other words, we're in community. We're all in the same dojo together and we're all training together. And those that, that maybe have been on this path more uh, and taking the long view will go, everybody is going to be a great training partner for me because inside of that, I'm a communicated learner and I have learning then. Those that may be more beginning in this level can see who are entirely welcome because really what I'm offering is not rocket science. It's pretty simple and straightforward. But what they get to see is that there's a, there's a community here and there's a community uplift that begins to happen. And I may not even notice that right away but over time and doing the practices, um, uh, that will begin to appear and reveal itself. It's a little bit like um, we're in San Francisco, a foggy night in San Francisco. It's a heavy fog. We go out and we hardly notice it because we're used to it. And we walk maybe six, seven, eight blocks. And by the time we get to the friend's house, we realize, oh, I'm wet. We didn't realize I got wet right away. I got wet over this voyage that I'm on. And it kind of seeps into me. Um, and that, so the other thing is, is that the basics that we will always practice, so you've worked with me over time, is that we will return to those. And those are the foundations throughout our whole lifetime. And, you know, I use the example of sports teams, basketball or football halftime in the team that's ahead. You ask the coach, what should we do? And they go, we just got a hold of our basics. Our basics are holding up. Let's do that. Team that's behind, you ask them and they say, we got to get back to basics. So it's like, what are those really pillars and structures that we just don't put in place and then move on? But we're really continuing to cultivate them and generate them and allow those things to begin to permeate us, just like the fog begins to permeate us. Thank you. Richard, um, can you say, you started to go there, I think in that last piece, but can you just say a little bit more about what makes this retreat of embodying the mystery different um, than embodied leadership or the coaching program? We're going to have more meditation practice, different types of meditation. We're going to have more practice of shifting states of consciousness. We're going to also look at our spiritual biographies, what, what are our biographies? You know, it's, it's really important to look at 
the lineages that we come from and who are our mentors and guides and teachers and ancestors, the elders that have already brought us to this moment. And while many of them may have been passed over or gone over, died at this point, their energy is still with us. And when we get caught up in the dailies of life is that we, we forget about that possibility that that also lives in our field of energy. They also live in our field of awareness. So um, uh, we will look much more at the notion of longing or yearning. And what does that mean inside of us? What does that mean inside of the human being, inside of the human condition, that there are people come to a certain place and they say, I know there's more to my life than this. There's a more that I can be more resourced. I can be more settled. I can be more present. I can be more contactful. I can, I can allow more love to come in. We'll be working with that. We'll be talking about the notion that in every transformation or change that we make, these two things usually show up. One is there's something I have to let go of. There's something I have to release. There's something I've been carrying in my pack that I have to release from my pack. And there's something I need to release or fall into. Release as letting go of something and then surrendering or falling into something. And how to live in that falling into something that space where we actually haven't reached that next space, but how to really allow ourselves the deep foundational trust that's in us and the basic ground that's already in us to be able to do that, as well as to inform us of that, you know, this behavior, this way of being, this identity is really no longer useful. And I can take that out of my pack. I can unpack that and maybe for a while live inside of even a wider space until the next thing really appears to me. We'll be doing practices that are, um, uh, will help us move the energy in our body and help us see that energy as spirit and we'll get in contact with our own stories about what do I, what do, not I, but everybody, your I, what do you mean when you talk about spirituality or spirit? Really fundamental and basic level. And how was that introduced to you? How did that happen for, to you? So, for just four mornings, that really seems like a lot. So I'll say, you know, in the afternoon, why don't you keep your afternoons free? Try some of these practices. Maybe be in silence as much as you can till the next morning. And, um, and then during the week, I'll encourage you to do practices that will continue to allow you to uh, uh, cultivate, cultivate the awareness of the wisdom and the compassion and the skill that's already yours. Um, this is a question that I just want to bring to you, Richard, of um, why this conversation now for you? What was the impulse behind writing your book at this moment in your career? Hmm. My career, I, I, um, path. Mm -hmm. uh, you really since a very, very young age, um, the question of spirit was introduced to me by my grandmother, my matriarchal grandmother, who was a, you know, she read, she did seances, she read palm tea leaves, she read palms, um, she was a, a mystic really, really a very special person. And um, uh, she, she, she died when I was in my early 20s, but she left a very strong imprint on me. 
And I, I want to tell you that story in the course because I know all of you have some kind of story like that, that it just dropped a seed and maybe it was a seed into hard pan, but it had enough water and it had enough soil to allow it to come to some fruition. And I've, I've always had that. It, it really is a basic come from. Um, and had developed many practices with that. And then as I began to work with, I, I could allow that to leach into, seep into individuals. But when I began to work with teams and organizations, if I brought that in, even if I brought in, now we're going to stand and feel our bodies, people look at me like I was crazy. You know, what do you mean? I, what does my body have to do with anything? You know, so I look at me side eye, or if I said, I want to introduce you to meditation. And I saw they had a picture of Maharishi over their heads with a big white beard or something. That's what that meant. Or, you know, I've been doing martial arts since I'm 12 and they saw Bruce Lee. So I thought, boy, that's a, that's a big, that's a big speed bump. So, you know, I would bring that in, slowly bring that in. And as time went on, you know, what Johnny Cabot has done with mindfulness, which is digestible and now a, now a post post capitalistic commodity too, which we throw our, which we get caught into. Um, however, uh, there's a much more opening now to that. And, and, and there's a urge inside of me to allow that to come out. And I don't, I hold that I'm a spiritual friend and I hold that I've had certain experiences that have come from really being fed generously by, by exemplary teachers, just exemplary teachers, and then doing practices that they encouraged over a long period of time, well over, well over 50 years, really. And, um, uh, and seeing that, number one, there seems to be this ongoing kind of conflict between what we call body and what we call spirit. There seems to be, we're in this time, which is catastrophic. We're in a catastrophic time. There's global pandemic. There's global anxiety. We get um, second generation or we get um, second level anxiety coming from people as soon as we step out. Um, we, we have very real concerns. Will this planet survive? Uh, how will we survive? Um, and there's um, huge pressures on our institutions, our political institutions. So I think this path of a, of a somatic spirit are connecting to source through the body so we are still in skillful action is very relevant right now. Not just for ourselves, where we want to really start with giving kindness to ourselves and generosity to ourselves, so that we can also expand that to others, that we're not doing violence to others. We're fighting for what we care about, we're taking stand for things. Um, I'm holding myself and other people's dignity. But we're not, we're not, we're seeing, we see that violence is a very, very, very big piece that we can't expand what's possible for ourselves on this planet for right now. So it seems timely, you know, and maybe not done this if I would have done the usual meditation retreat that I do at the ranch every year and brought more of these things into it as I, as I'm freeing myself and as I'm in these things, I would have brought more of that into it. But COVID makes that difficult. So here we are and we're here with a lot of people and with a lot of um, different ways of coming into this question. Yeah, thank you. Um, and just to work for this next little bit of time, I wanna take some of the questions about specifics around the retreat 
And just right now to let folks know if you're wanting to know more about the Embodying the Mystery Retreat, you can find out more details and actually go ahead and register um, at embodyingthemysteryretreat.com. And um, really, as we kind of dive in here to some more of the specifics about what will happen, um, there's a question about what if people can't make the session live? What's your take on that? Um, I think that the, the, the session will, will, the session itself, the retreat itself, either one session or entirety will be valuable to people um, um, even if you're not there live. I think that if we, even though we're working through electricity and it's more difficult to really feel people, it is a start in what we're doing to really feel each other and feel community in places where people will get into small groups, have conversations, it enriches the program. But yes, you can, so I, I that's, that would be, that would be best. Um, if you can't do those things, then I think that you'll still find value out of it. I know places where I'm doing that, where things have been re-recorded, pre-recorded. I'm not able to ask questions, but they're valuable to me. Mm -hmm. That goes right into this next question of if folks will be able to ask you questions live during the retreat. Absolutely, absolutely. We'll always have a place for, for questions live. Mm -hmm. Great, and um, how much spiritual practice or experience does a person need before, and I guess we could throw in there too, somatic practice um, to join the retreat? Um, I think that, that if you, if you haven't really considered yourself being in a spiritual practice or some spiritual path, that there's still, you're still a spiritual being. Spirit is still animating you and moving you. And that um, the experiences that people who've been on path, spiritual, formal paths for a long time, people who may not have done it have those experiences too. They're really part of our birthright. They're part of our birthright. And um, really what it requires is that we, we find a way of settling into that wisdom that could be seen as a practice and maybe and even more powerful that we find ourselves in a community of people that settle um, that uh, into those practices that allow us to really feel, oh, our sense of heart or compassion or love is so much wider and deeper than I thought. Um, my, capacity, my capacity for really being skillful in my action, what's too much, what's too little, um, where can I be? more steely-like, where do I need to open up, seems to be really already there. That foundation is there, and I can um, uh, tap into that in a more effective way, as well as to the kind of inherent wisdom that we all have. And can you say a little bit, um, before we go into the real nuts and bolts of the retreat, can you just say a little bit about the arc and what you want folks to be able to come away with after this four days of being in retreat together? I would like you to have enlarged the questions that you're in. So the questions you're in about your livingness, about your connecting, about connecting to something larger than your own personality or character how you can be more effective in your work, that those questions have just deepened and have just enlarged and they've widened. They've widened too. So that we stay on this path of not closing something down like, oh, here's the answer. Because really, if you're on the path long enough, you'll say, oh, this next stage, or this next chapter, this next intersection essentially goes, here's Here's the mystery still. So there, there's that. 
um, I think there's a really a possibility of committing to a practice or being in a practice, both in your ordinary life of walking from car to office, those that are still going to office, stepping outside, interrelating with your family and so forth, that you find that there's, there's a different sense of space around it where the busyness of thinking, the busyness of planning, the busyness of regretting, the busyness of going, gee, how many years do I have left here? Can be there, but it has space to all live in there in which, in which inspires a feeling of fulfillment and subtleness and, and peace. And also that we come away with even a keener distinction between, oh, this is me being violent to myself. This is me being violent to the environment. This is me being violent to somebody else. And going, and that's not me. That is not my aspiration. My aspiration is to be kinder, more generous, more respectful, more present, more fulfilled, and more contributory towards others. And with that, before we close, I want to make sure that folks know where they can go to find out more about the retreat and also register if you're interested in deepening into this conversation. Again, the website for this program is embodyingthemysteryretreat.com. And the dates of the weekends will be March 13th and 14th. And then the following weekend, March 20th and the 21st. And really we're holding these two weekends as um, full retreat weekends. Um, it'll be a combination of live teaching, Q&A with Richard, um, breakouts with one another and community, um, and then an invitation to practice for the remainder of the day to do some of these practices, as Richard said. Um, for the rest of the day and be in retreat and really hold this time as um, a sacred time together. Um, and then if you go ahead and register now, um, you'll get $100 off of the registration price. Um, we also right now have two payment options. You can pay in installments or you can pay in one, um, one payment. Um, and again, to go ahead and register, you can go to embodyingthemysteryretreat.com and um, join us for a deepening of this conversation. Um, and just to close us out, Richard, um, do you wanna just share what your intention or heart's intention is for this time together or anything more about the retreat itself? I know there's a lot that, that I'm gonna learn here too. This, this is the first, just through this medium. And always I know that there's a lot that you're going to be learning from each other. And um, that really, uh, I think that we can all see that those are looking at the world and the, the, um, the, the moments that, that we're in, big, big, big historical shifts, is that we can contribute to it in a, in a, more, in a more generous way, in a kinder way, in a more life-affirming way. Thank you. Hope to see you all there. Are we completing now, Stephanie? Well, we looks like we have four more minutes. So are you open to squeezing in another question? Absolutely. Here? Just, okay, thanks y'all. Um, so Rui, are you why? Do you wanna come off of mute and just ask your question? There you go. Hi. I'm Droy from uh, Alpa, Honduras. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm enjoying this uh, Q and A immensely. Um, I, I'm relatively new. I did one of your workshops, but I've always had. I've always prized that one of those things is instinct, and following your gut in certain moments have have been something positive. But I'm trying to reconcile how that works while I'm going through this process of trying to do our somatic opening or or, or changing. 
And uh, it uh, actually led me to insecurity versus security. So that's uh, what I'm trying to, to see how to reconcile whether how flowing or hearing that inner voice sometimes just flowing with it versus uh, coming into that too much of a questioning process. Um, Rui, would you, would you um, ask that question again in shorthand? Yeah. So um, in different points, uh, following my instinct or voice has been something positive. Yes. Um, and has allowed me to act with, with very quick and with confidence. But, but as I'm starting to do so, uh, more somatic uh, practices, I'm finding myself in a very shaky ground. And I'm trying to reconcile following my voice versus questioning as much of it, I guess. I don't know. Um, uh, so the, your, how you describe this open ground um, is, is really descriptors that many people have, certainly a descriptor that I would have for myself when I'm going from one way of being, uh, one relationship, one work, whatever change that is where I'm going through this open space, it can feel like, uh, where's the ground? Or where's the, where's the boundaries to all this? So I wanna say that from the point of view is, is like, is, is to normalize it in a sense. Yes, this is part of the territory. And also that over time we see with so many people and it's occurred with myself is that there's a place once I can stabilize myself, it still may be, I don't know how to move forward or what should I do here or what should I do there? But my state of being is stabilized somewhat. And from there, it's like Lao Tzu, the Chinese philosopher said, first, first let the dirt settle. First let all the, the dirt's going in the pond and stuff like that. First let it settle and then make that choice. Also, that lives in the long view. That really lives right. in the long view where we, we really give ourselves the permission to say, no, now is not the time to make this choice. I, 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 need, I just need more time now. And there may be somebody gets triggered and us like, time's going by, what will happen? Will I lose it? But really trust that basic place in yourself around that. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Well, thank you all. We're at our time and we want to honor your time. And just want to say thank you to you, Richard, for making this time available for a rich dialogue. And um, we're really looking forward to spending those four days with you to deepen into this conversation. And for those of you who are watching live and for those of you who are watching virtually, um, we hope that you join us. Um, again, more information can be found at embodyingthemysteryretreat.com and we hope to see you soon.